I am really excited um, for the message today because I think it's something that God's just been actually placing on the hearts of a lot of people lately. And I always love that when there's confirmations and confirmations. And actually there is all the time for what God's speaking. He loves, he, he, I think he knows that we need repetition. He knows that we need um, him to kind of keep showing us things. And so I love how that happens. Um, and so we're, I'm excited for that this morning. But I first just want to say, I love you guys. Seriously, like I feel so um, unbelievably blessed to be part of this church. I really, um, I mean, all churches are cool, but <laughs> I really, there's something special and unique um, about, about all of you, and, and really it's, it's the calling that God has on each of you and on this church and why he's brought us together, and um, I just think, you know, I was just thinking as we were worshiping, it's like, I think so easily we can fall into the trap of just kind of going through the motions of church. But I think what I love so much here is people are really genuinely hungry for God and worship and love him. And, and I think that's true all over um, in, in churches all over the world. Um, but I really just I really just think you guys are awesome. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, this morning we are talking about the power of words, and I'm sure all of you guys have read this before, you've talked about it before, you know, we know all of the, the different things that, um, that, that are said about words and how important, you know, a little bit later I'm going to share with you that age-old saying, sticks and stones might break, break my bones, but names or words will never hurt me, and that is... A lie. That is so wrong. And I remember growing up, it's like that's just something that is taught to kids. You know, it's like somebody says something mean, and it's like, oh, don't let their words hurt you. Well, of course their words are going to hurt you. Uh, and so, so I just think that that's something that we really, really need to, to recognize. And the amazing thing is, like, I don't know if you guys have noticed this before, but God always seems to have the truth. Yeah. So, so, and th I think that's true in like science and all of that too. Sometimes people can feel like, oh, science contradicts God. But the more we learn, like science keeps changing, God never does. And the more we learn about history and science and all of that, it always ends up lining up with what God says. And I think that's true. It's like we can kind of teach our kids, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And then God's like, hello, read your Bible. That's not what I say. And what he says is uh, Proverbs 18, 21. He says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And that verse actually um, came up, uh, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago at boot camp, and we were just having a, I don't honestly even remember the exact conversation that night, but it came up in our discussion, and Joelle brought that verse up, and she was just saying, we are kind of talking about belief and unbelief, and she was saying, we have to be so careful who we even ask to pray for us. Because if people are coming with unbelief, their words can have power. And she brought up this verse and how it's so important that we are speaking life. We are speaking God's truth. It's an intense verse. And today I want to kind of just unpack what it means. But I want to point out, it doesn't say happiness and sadness are in the power of the tongue. Or it doesn't say encouragement and discouragement are in the power of the tongue. We can sometimes minimize it to just mean that. It's like, oh yeah, your words are gonna, people's words are either gonna make you happy or sad or they're gonna either encourage you or discourage you. It doesn't say that. It's a lot more intense than that. It says, what does it say? Death and life. Death and life. That's extremely intense that it says death and life. And then, and then it talks about how, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And you go, what does that mean? See, the, the, the words that we say produce fruit. And the Bible loves to talk actually about fruit a lot. In Luke 6, uh, verses 43 and 45, through 45, we're not going to actually look at it. But it talks about the, the scripture where Jesus is talking about how bad trees don't produce good fruit. And good trees don't produce bad fruit, right? And he gives some examples of like, you're not going to find good fruit coming out of thorns and, and all that kind of thing. And then he says, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. 
So, so it's important that we recognize that the words that are coming out of our mouth reflect what's in our heart. And that's what this verse means when it says, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So the words that we say are actually bear fruit for people to eat. That are e that's either going to poison them or nourish them. This is so, so important. So if we look at these words, all right, if we look at the scripture, it, it is showing us that words are so powerful. They come from within. But today we're not going to only look at how to be careful with our words because some of you guys are going, oh, okay, I've learned this lesson before. I know I need to be careful what I say and I need to be nice to people. And, you know, it's the things you are taught in kindergarten. Like, don't, if you don't have something nice to say, then don't say anything at all. Yes, it's that, but it's more than just our words. It's also today I want to talk about the words that are spoken over you that have maybe affected your life. I want to speak today about the practical that, yes, somebody says something mean to you, it's going to hurt you. So that's very practical that words are, have power in that way. But I also want to talk about the spiritual, the fact that, like, like we already mentioned, it doesn't just say happiness and sadness, how you feel is going to be affected by words. It actually says the death, it has the power of death and life. So there's a spiritual aspect going on to our words that is so, so important. But I want to first just look at, okay, if, if God says that our words are so important, I want to look at a little bit of the history of words with God. And I'm sure you all know this, but when God created everything, when he decided, I'm going to create the universe, the stars, the galaxies, I'm going to create the earth, the water, the sea, the sky, I'm going to create mankind, Adam and Eve, what did he do? How did he do it? I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. It's in the title. He used his words, right? He used his words. He, he says, let there be light. And there was light. He spoke and his words created. So words are super powerful, right? He doesn't get out a hammer and nail and start to chisel the earth. <laughs> he doesn't, he does not get out a paintbrush and start to brush what he, you know, paint what he, what he wants it to look like. He doesn't use his hands or his feet. He doesn't, you know, just think or imagine it into existence. He uses his words. Words have power. His words have obviously ultimate power. But he's just demonstrating for us. He chose to create everything using words. And then he goes, hey, you're created in my image. Your words have power too. Does that make sense? And then another thing that shows us how important words are is that Jesus, one of the descriptions, the first description actually in the Gospel of John, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four Gospels that are written about the life of Jesus. And so John, who is pretty much known to be Jesus' best friend, the, one of the first descriptions that he gives, gives is he says that Jesus is the Word made flesh. Jesus is the Word God's truth now made into human flesh. Again, that's, words are so powerful. If Jesus is the word, truth, made flesh, it shows us again how powerful words are, how powerful God's truth is, how important it is that we are speaking God's truth, God's words Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, the creator of the universe, the Messiah, the Redeemer, is called the Word made flesh. And then another thing that shows us again that how important words are is it says that we live by God's words. I'm going to look, there's a lot of scriptures about this, but I'm going to look at two um, specifically. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 says, but he answered, it is written... And this is Jesus speaking. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, and that word there in the Greek is rhema, that comes from the mouth of God. So he's saying, we don't just need bread to live. That might keep us physically alive, but we, the only way we actually continue living is by God's rhema word. And then the, the second one, is Hebrews 4.12, and you'll notice it uses a different word for, for word. It says, for the word, logos, the word of God, 
is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Dang, that's powerful. God's word can actually cut through and discern what's in our hearts. But again, it points out, it's a different word that's used in the, the Greek there, Logos. Now, we've talked about this before, so I'm going to go over it just really briefly. But in Matthew 4, it uses the word rhema, which is more like the right now word of God. It's like, like the Holy Spirit quickening a word for right now. Whereas logos is like the written constant, not always written, but it's the constant word of God. It's God's ultimate truth forever. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so logos is his unchanging truth, his written word, unchanging communication, Rhema is his voice to a specific person or situation through the Holy Spirit. The two will never, ever contradict each other, ever. But the, the rhema word, the right now word, it shows that God's voice is, is alive and speaking all the time. And we need to be aware because sometimes when we look at scripture, there can be we can look and we can go, okay, well, what is God saying? Because there's two different things in the word. And we go, well, what, what is he meaning? Well, we need the rhema voice of God to speak to us, to show us, to point out, well, what is he saying for today? What is he saying for right now for me? Is now a time for me to rest or is now a time for me to work? Is now a time, you know, for our church to, to, to be, you know, growing in a certain area or is it time to go out and reach out, you know, and it can be all of them at the same time, but we need that rhema voice of God. But what I find so amazing is right here, it's showing us that we need the word, God's word, his voice, because it's so powerful. It's how we actually live. Right? We, God's word actually gives us life. And Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So hopefully that gives a little bit of just a foundation of the fact that, like, do we agree God believes that words are super powerful? Yeah? Okay, so God has a really high value for words. Words have power. Again, death and life are in are the power of the tongue, have the power of the tongue, sorry, I'm messing it up, are in the power of the tongue, death and life. And this can be in a really practical sense, and that's the first point, is very practically, our words have the power to harm or to heal. Do you guys get that? So our words have the power to harm people or to heal them. And the same is true in the reverse. People's words, as much as we try to just kind of go, ah, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, People's words, if we listen to them, can have the power to either harm or to heal. Like we already talked about that silly little saying that, that hopefully we're not teaching kids anymore, but I know that when I was a kid, that's something that I learned at school. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I want to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can shatter or shape me. Right? Words can either completely shatter my soul and stick to me and break me down, or they can shape me into what God actually intended me to be. Our words have so much power. Proverbs 12, 18. You guys, Proverbs is a great, it's a great book to look at all the time. There is so much in there about the power of our words. Proverbs 18, 12 says, There is one who speaks rashly like he like he thrusts of a sword, the thrusts of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. That's exactly what I'm saying right here. I didn't make that up. It's right from the word that our words can bring harm or healing. They can harm or they can heal. It says people who speak harshly, it's like thrusting a sword. It's like a weapon that can hurt, can kill people, but if we use wisdom, God's wisdom, we can bring healing to people. I heard a great, great quote this week. It says, words are free. It's how you use them that may cost. You know, words, like, yeah, I could just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk up here. <laughs> but the truth is, how we use our words, words are free, but how we use them can cost us and can cost those around us. If I asked each of you right now, 
Did anyone ever say anything to you? Like think as far back as you can as a child. Did anyone ever say anything to you that impacted your life negatively? Anybody? I guarantee all of you right now, something came to your mind, or if you could think about it for a few seconds, you would think of something that somebody said to you as a child that you still remember to this day. It could have been 10 years ago, 20 years, 50 years ago, and you still remember it. Why? Because words have power to harm us. You could probably immediately think of what they said. You can picture that person. You can probably picture where you were, how you, how you felt. You've probably played it over and over in your mind. Maybe you haven't thought of it for years, but if it's something that still comes up right now, it's probably something you played over and over and actually affected your identity. Words have so much power. Sadly, probably all of us could write a book on all the bad things that people have said, the things that have hurt us, because words have power. And sadly, often the bad things that people say can outweigh the good. You think about it and somebody can say 10 great things about you and one person says something mean, what are you gonna keep thinking about for the rest of the day? That one bad thing, right? What is that? But, but it's because we so easily can believe the negative about ourselves rather than believing the truth of what God says about us. But hopefully, Hopefully, and if this is not you, then please come and talk to me after because I want to pray with you. But hopefully, if I asked you, tell me one thing that someone has said that has changed your life in a good way, that has shaped your life. Hopefully, all of you guys can come up with a whole list of those too. Those moments where somebody says something to you and you're like, wow, that's truth. And it shifts the direction of your life or it helps you to see how God really sees you. I want to just go through, um, these aren't in your, your bulletin or on the screen or anything, but just, I want to just read to you just a few of the things that Proverbs says, uh, that Proverbs says about words. Proverbs 11.9 says, evil words destroy one's friends. Wise discernment rescues the godly. Proverbs 15.4 says, gentle words bring life and health. That's amazing. Words can actually bring us physical health and emotional health. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Proverbs 16, 24 says, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Proverbs 18, 4 says, a person's words can be life-giving water. Words of true wisdom are as refreshing as a bubbling brook. And Proverbs 25, 18 says, telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an ax wounding them with a sword, or shooting them with a sharp arrow. Words have power. The first thing that we see in scripture is that God uses words to create. And we have to start to recognize that our words can either create chaos, or they can create peace and truth and speak to people's lives. We know, all of us know how it feels to have people's words harm or heal us. Probably, sadly, all of us, no, not sadly, also in a good way, all of us also know what it feels like to be on the other side of that, to be the one who gives a word that brings healing or life or encouragement to someone or, sadly, can hurt someone and you say it and then you regret it. We know what it is to be on both of those sides. And so today I want to encourage us, choose to speak life, right? There's that um, song by Toby Mac speak life, and it's all about this scripture that we need to, with our lives, we need to choose to speak life into the people around us, into our situations. And secondly, choose to surround yourself by people who speak life. Guess what, guys? You get to choose who, whose voice you listen to. You get to choose. I know that, you know, firstly, you can choose who you hang out with, and even if there are some people that you're kind of forced to hang out with, you can still choose to listen to their words or to instead choose to listen to what the word says. Listen to what God says. And make sure, if you have to be surrounded by some people who are negative, make sure that you spend way more time with people who are positive and speak life to you. Does that sound good? All right, James 3, 5 actually talks about how the tongue is such a small member of our bodies and yet it, it can 
with a little spark set a whole forest on fire. Our, t- our words are so powerful. So in a very practical sense, we get this, right? That our words can bring harm or healing. Every word and even the tone in which you say it can actually bring life or can bring death. Matthew 15, 35 through 37 says, a good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth eagle, evil, not eagles, evil. I tell you, I'm tired. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account. This is so important, you guys. Are you with me? No one's falling asleep? Okay. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. And so while there is a very practical sense in which our words have power, there's also an extremely important spiritual sense in which our words have power. And that comes to our second point. All words, all words, either partner with God's truth or with Satan's lies. All words either partner with God's truth or with Satan's lies. Like I just said, every word you say and even in the way you say it. We can say something nice, but it's like we've got anger inside of ourselves. And and that same tone can bring destruction. So the words that we say either partner with God's truth or with Satan's lies. So I want to say, what are you speaking and what are you allowing to be spoken over your life, your circumstances, the people around you, your family? Are you partnering with heaven or are you partnering with hell? That's the truth, is when we speak negative things that God does not say about our situations, about our family members, about our church, about our job, when we speak things that is not God's heart, we are actually literally partnering with Satan's lies. And that actually has power. And we're going to get into that in just a few seconds, but but we have to start to recognize that our words, all our words, either partner with God's truth or with God's lies. And speaking God's word over people has spiritual impact. I want to read to you John 15, 3. It says, already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. That's pretty intense. That a person is made clean by the word spoken over them. Our words have spiritual impact. Now I want to actually read to you um, a couple scriptures that I just find so, so fascinating. And you're going to have to track with me. Are you guys there? Okay. You guys, I need you to liven up. I <laughs> I've been up a lot lately because Cody's gone, and um, my two-year-old has decided that um, when Cody's gone, she's just going to stay up all night. So, <laughs> so I'm tired. So I need you guys to have energy with me, okay? So now you're going to be really excited because we're going to talk about gossipy women, all right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. We, we are talking about gossipy women, but that's not why you need to be excited. But in 1 Timothy 5... Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's talking about how there's some idle women in your church, and there's some women who have kind of started to gossip and all of that stuff. And I'm going to read to you guys what it says. It says, at the same time, they also learn to be idle, so lazy, not filling their life with purpose, as they go around from house to house, and not merely idle, but also they become gossips and busybodies talking about things not proper to mention. That's 1 Timothy 5, 13. So I want to just highlight to you two Greek words, and I'm so terrible at um, pronouncing Greek words, so I'm just going to kind of point at the word, okay? So the first one that I want to look at is the word gossips. And that word there um, is Phileros, I think, something like that. But it means a person uttering or doing silly things. uh, Babbling, foolish things, trifling, vain things, okay? So, So this word for gossip is just like, they're just talking silly things. It's nonsense. 
right? And we've all had that experience where we've said things that are gossipy, that are, they're just not helpful. They're silly. It's like, come on, what are you talking about? This is not truth. So there's that word, but this is, the second word is the one that I really want you to focus in on, and I want you to, to circle the word busybodies in your notes. Busybodies. Because this word for busybodies in the Greek is actually, and I'm going to butcher it, but it's perergos, I think, something like that. Whatever you guys want to say it, that's fine. But basically it means, I've given you the fancy definition there in the Strong's um, Concordance, but the same word, if you look at that last line, the same word for busybody is also a word that's used for curious arts or magic arts. And you're going, what on earth does that mean? Well, I want to read to you another place where this same word is used, but it's translated differently in our English. In Acts chapter 19, now this is after um, Jesus has died, he's risen, he's ascended, and the church has started um, through the apostles, and now it's spreading, and there's people like Barnabas and Paul who are getting involved, and so they're going, and amazing things are happening in this place called Ephesus, which is where we get the book of Ephesians. So in Ephesus, it talks about these crazy things are happening, and now you have to also realize that at the time, it was very normal to have like spiritual things happen. Like in our Western world, we don't see that as much. But even today, if you go out into Africa and to some rural places, India, there's a lot more spiritual things that are happening that you can actually see take place. Um, whereas here, we've become just a little too sim- civilized, right? And so anyway, so this, all this crazy stuff is happening. And it talks about how um, both the Jews and the Greeks came and they start to be in awe of what is happening when the apostles are coming through and, and the followers of Jesus are coming through and they're speaking the word. And it says the Lord Jesus was being magnified. And, it, and then it talks about how they kept coming and they were confessing their sins and they were disclosing what they'd been doing. And then this is where I want to pick up um, in Acts 19, it says, and many of those who practiced magic, that's the same word as we just spoke about for busybodies. The same, so, so many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they added up their prices of the books and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So they had these like scrolls. Um, And they burned them all. And it says, so the word of the Lord was growing and prevailing mightily. And now you're asking me, Tricia, what on earth? Like, what is the point you're trying to get at here? I just, as I dug deeper and deeper and deeper into this this week, and I looked at that, I don't think it's a coincidence that in the Greek, if we were reading in the original Greek, that same word is used for people who speak idle words like those women that's talking about, it's like gossip, oh yeah, that's just like, you know, silly and um, they're just being foolish. But then it says, but they're also being busy bodies and they are talking about things that are not supposed to be mentioned. And so it talks about how they, that word is like an evil form of magic. That their words are actually have a spiritual dimension to them. Is that making sense? Because then when we have people in Acts 19 who come and they have actually been practicing the magic arts, like witchcraft and some other translations that talks about um, they're practicing sorcery. And, And it's the same word that's used there, that our words actually have power in the spiritual realm. The same as those people who are actually practicing witchcraft and all of that kind of crazy stuff. We are not not just physical beings occasionally experiencing something spiritual. We are first and foremost spiritual beings. You guys know that? But I think one of the, the things that the enemy tries to convince us is like, oh, no, 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 no. You are physical beings. Everything needs to be practical. Everything needs to just fit within what we can understand as humans. And occasionally you'll get to touch God in the spirit. It's not that. The spiritual realm is working all around us. And when we use our words, we can either partner with God's truth or we can partner with Satan's lies. Is that making sense? Just as a little side note, I just want to also mention, I can't, I can't talk about that scripture without also mentioning, be really careful of 
the, what it, what's quoted here is the curious arts. And in, in our world, it's, it's stuff like palm reading and astrology and psychics. And we can kind of look at that stuff and be like, oh, it's just silly, it's just silly. You guys, the spiritual realm is real. And what we do as Christians is we are going to communicate with God, right? We are, we are tapping into what God speaks to us. We want to always make sure that that lines up with what we see in scripture. But people who are practicing stuff like, you know, in, in other countries like witchcraft, or here too, witchcraft, palm, palm reading, all that kind of stuff, they are tapping into the spiritual realm too, but it's the demonic. So I know this is getting weird. That's all I'm going to say about that, but just be careful. Be careful. And what's crazy is if you look back at Acts 19, a lot of these people who come, and they actually confess, and they, um, they now cast, it said they had their scrolls that they used, like probably spells and stuff like that that they used for their magic. They come and they burn it. But what you have to realize is at that time, because this was so common, and there's other places in Acts where you read about this, that they're actually making a living by practicing this curious arts. Uh, it talks about the, the girl who has like the psychic abilities and she's making money for people by going and, and you know, being a psychic. Um, they are actually, at the time, you know, medicine was not as readily available. So a lot of the stuff, it's like medicinal. Like if you go into Africa, they'll go to their witch doctors before they go to a physician, right? And so, so a lot of this, you gotta realize that these people, they're making a living. This is their life and it has power. It's just from the wrong place. And they're getting, a lot of these people, it actually talks about, I think it's in Acts 8, where it talks about um, a guy, I think it was Simon, who he was actually famous. Like he made a name for himself by practicing this, this curious art. But then what I love is it talks about how they came and they threw all of that stuff and they burned it. And it says that when they added up the cost of everything they burned, it was like it was worth 50,000 silver coins. Or uh, another translation talks about instead of silver coins, it says drachma. Now, drachma is a daily wage. So it's estimated that at the very least, if you were looking at comparable today, at the very least, it would be worth $100,000, but more than likely, because, it, because each drachma was worth a day's wages, it's closer to four to five million dollars worth of scrolls that they burnt. These people were willing to give up everything because the truth of God was way more important. That was like a whole tangent that has nothing to do with what we're talking about, except to say, is what God says about you the most important thing in your life? Or are you listening to what the world says? Are the words that are coming out of your mouth partnering with God's truth or with the enemy's lies? And then the last thing, and this is going to be short, but it's the most important. Point number three is we need to break lies and build truth. We need to break lies and build truth truth. The reality is, some of you guys, when I asked you, you know, can you think of one thing that somebody said to you as a child that hurt you? And we blow that off. We, again, we minimize words and we go, oh, it's just something they said and it's fine. But those things can actually create strongholds in our lives. If we allow the words that people have spoken that have actually been partnering with what Satan says and not what God says about us, if we allow those things in our lives and we don't break off those lies, they will build up strongholds in our lives and they will change the way we view ourselves. They will change the way we view God. They will change the way we view our church. They will change the way we view our world. Those words have power. We've talked about this scripture a lot before too, but it's 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. It says, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world, right? We're not fi fighting a physical battle. We're fighting a spiritual battle. And then it says, on the contrary, they have divine power. So meaning God's power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
I'm not going to get into all the, all the you know, Greek words there, but I just want to look at that one word, strongholds, or in other translations it says fortresses, and what that word actually means, this is the actual biblical definition, is the arguments and reasonings by which a disputant endeavors to fortify his opinion and defend it against his opponent. Now, those are a lot of fancy words just to say that when God says there are strongholds in your life, in your thoughts, those strongholds are actually the arguments and the reasoning that people have said, things that people have said against you build up fortresses in your life. But God's word God's power can come in and demolish those. And that is what's so important is we need to break down the lies that people have spoken over us. We need to break down the lies that we've allowed ourselves to believe. Any thought that you've ever had that is contrary to what God says about you is a lie from the pit of hell. Anything. Any time that you've ever said, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, God doesn't love me, I'm not worth it, I'm not creative, I'm not, whatever it is, any time that you have allowed yourself. I just, I feel like as I look out, there are people that, that from childhood, somebody told you, maybe a parent, maybe a teacher, maybe a friend who is just saying stupid things, told you that you weren't good enough told you that you weren't strong enough, told you that you wouldn't amount to anything. And those things Satan has used to create strongholds in your life that have kept you back from God's purpose. But I'm telling you today that they can be broken in the name of Jesus, right? That they can be absolutely demolished. Why? Because if the God who created the universe is just with a simple word, If he can do that, surely he can come in and with his truth to you, he can speak life and he can destroy all of those lies. So many of us, yeah. So many of us think that all we have to do is when somebody says something that's hurtful, all we need to do is forgive them. Yeah, that's a really important step. But I think sometimes we keep on going back and like, how how many of you have ever forgiven someone and then the next day you're like, oh, I feel like I need to forgive them again. And then like a minute later, you're like, I thought I did it. Okay, let me try again. I think that maybe the reason that we have such a hard time with forgiveness is because we think all it is is saying, oh, I just forgive you. You know, we release, oh, we understand that maybe they didn't mean it or it's not true. But what we actually have to do is not just forgive them, but we need to break that lie and replace it with God's truth. So, so right now, I'm going to just, just pray over all of us. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I I just want to take some time and pray, and I'm probably going to be silent because I want you to spend some time with God. And even if you've, like, never spoken to him in your life, I want you right now to open up your heart to him and say, God, is there anything in my life that I've been believing, that I've been partnering with, that is not from you? Maybe it's something, maybe it's a lie about your bank account that, you know, you're, no matter how hard you work, you're just never going to make it that God's not going to provide for you. Maybe it's a lie about your child that they're just never going to get themselves together. Maybe it's a lie about yourself. But it is time today to break those lies.
in the powerful name of Jesus and covered by the blood that he shed on the cross for us. May every single lie from the enemy be broken, never to be rebuilt again. In Jesus' name. Jesus, we pray for your truth. God, I pray that you would bring clarity to every mind in here, every heart in here. God, all the pain that has been caused in people's lives because of the power of words. God, may we never diminish that. May may we never limit it again, but recognize that our words have power. And every time we speak over our situations, over our family members, over ourselves, every time that anyone speaks something over us, God, will you help us to break the lies and embrace the truth? God, help us to be people who speak life and only allow life to enter into our hearts. Only allow your truth to enter into our hearts, God. That is the only way that we are going to be the kind of children who can go and turn the world upside down because, God, we no longer have to worry about what everybody else thinks about us because we are so deeply rooted in what you say about us and what you say about our children, what you say about our parents, what you say about our situations, what you say about our health. So in Jesus' name, we speak truth. We speak life. God, may you be glorified. John 8, 31 and 32 says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. God's truth. He's talking here. If you will hold to my teaching, if you will hold to what Jesus said is true, if you will hold to what Jesus says is true about you, then you will know the truth, but not only will you know it in your head, it will literally set you free. It will set you free to be able to live powerfully the way that God created you. It is time for us as believers to recognize that we can speak life into our situations. Something that I've started to be really careful of is no matter how bad things get, and I'm not always good at it, but no matter how bad things get, I try not to speak negatively over anything. Because why? Because our words have power. And we sometimes think it's, oh, I'm just getting it off my chest. No, our words have power. So you speak life over your family. You speak life over yourself. You speak life over this church. Guys, there are people, some people who maybe, you know, just haven't agreed with what we're doing here. There are people in the community who just don't like Christians or people all over the world who just don't like Christians, and they speak death over this church. They speak death over God's church worldwide, and we as believers need to stand up and start to speak life. No matter how messed up we might be, no matter how messed up the church might be, no matter how messed up and hypocritical Christians might be, may we never be people who partner with Satan in in agreeing with those lies. We need to start to speak life. Have I made my point? Yeah, okay. Just as we close today, I want to encourage you. Some of the things that have been spoken over you are so deeply painful that I want to encourage you that if you need to take time and spend time in here just with you and God, or if you want to come up to the front or just raise your hand, we've got leaders who would love to pray with you. We could just sit with you, we could pray with you, we can pray, you know, that that the lives would be broken, but I encourage you, or if you want to go home and do this, don't just have this be a message that, you know, five minutes from now you're going to forget and you're going to go on with your life. Not because anything that I've said is anything special, but because God has so much more for you that if you will partner with his truth, you will be set free. So you take time, and whenever, maybe over the next week, be praying that God will reveal to you some of the lies you believed, and every time he reveals one, don't just blow it off. You, you, come, you break that lie in the name of Jesus, and you accept God's truth. God, we love you. We love you. We thank you so much that your truth prevails. We thank you so much that no matter what the enemy tries to throw at us, God, your truth prevails. 
But God, we also know that when we believe what the enemy says, we give him power in our lives. We give him power in our children's lives. We give him power in our situations. And so right now, Jesus, we want to commit to you to listen to your truth. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we get to read your word and partner with your word and have your Holy Spirit speak truth to us. Jesus, we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. One thing I forgot to mention is uh, we have a card for Ed and Mara. <clears throat> so is it out? Tayden has it. Okay, so it's out on the patio. We would love for you to go, even if you just want to sign your name or write your favorite scripture, whatever you want to do, we'd love to be able to send them off just to be able to remember all of us. So um, just grab that card out there, and may the peace and power of Jesus be with you.